cholesterol. So this is probably the one that we want to try and modulate now. So the biggest thing for us to consider here is the total cholesterol of 5.02 is being skewed because that LDL is, is, is higher than we probably want it to be realistically. So guys, Derek from Today we're going to be checking out the truth about my blood work results, honest breakdown in all caps. This is a dissection of Brandon's biomarkers to essentially decide if he is able to embark on a full-blown off-season blast phase. And as you would imagine, the comment section has some uh, waiting for the Delt Lord to do a full breakdown. Fire emoji, shake my fucking hand, bro. Looking forward to a breakdown of this by Coach Greg and Derek. You know what's coming. I can already feel the super physiological amounts of knowledge about to, to be imparted onto us by the Delt Lord himself. Devil emoji times two. So I am indeed going to put it on 1.25 times speed. And uh, we'll get through the shit. You're going to be learning about what the results are, but also I'm going to be learning a lot myself as well. Guys, as you can see, we are currently on the call with Callum. We're going to go over the blood results now. We've got them all loaded up. This is the deciding factor almost in whether we can begin the off-season properly or, or we need some more time to get healthier. Drinking these aren't good for the blood. I should probably start. Can you want me to share screen? I can share now. The prep that we'd obviously run through, the cutoff point was obviously that July time window. So the one thing you've got to appreciate when you're transitioning into a, a post-dart recovery phase is it's going to take the body a little bit of time to clear the drugs that were being used on the actual prep itself. So the majority of those estimates were ananthate. The half-life of that is going to span about four weeks, four weeks or so. So we've got to appreciate the fact that when we were pulling those those out of the stack and dropping down to this kind of physiological cruise, it's going to take us about four weeks for those to actually start to clear the blood in the first place. Yeah, so everyone, they think you're on test E, start your PCT after two weeks. Nah, bro. Definitely not. Physiological. When I say physiological, I mean like imagine a... And by the way, he doesn't PCT. I'm just saying like these hormones have not cleared to a point that they're no longer having some impact on negative feedback as well as other physiologic functions, hit to your biomarkers, etc. After two weeks, this shit is absolutely still in your system. The baseline level in the blood that your body is capable of producing itself. So when we look at TRT deployment, like hormone therapy, hormone replacement therapy for, for males, you're going to average, you know, somewhere between that 25 and 30 nanomolar mark. And we'll, we'll look at that on the blood work in a minute. But we're essentially trying to establish physiological hormone levels to allow for your blood work across the board to improve in terms of the, the health status that we're going through. So you can see there that we've budgeted in four weeks of clearance, which taken has taken us to the end of July. And then we've just literally gone through that eight week window from August through to September, where we've spent time physiological here. This last eight weeks or so, body composition is still in a pretty good place considering where your body weight is because we're averaging kind of high 230s at the moment, right? 240. Uh, no, actually 243.2 uh, yesterday. Okay, so th there's about there's about 40, 35, 40 pounds there. Once your body weight's got back to a normal set point after prep's finished, we've had about 35, 40 pounds of gain in that eight week period. So now we're moving into October. We'll show blood work in a minute, but we're moving into October fresh in terms of the fatigue from prep being managed and is now gone. And the last piece of the puzzle now is just clearance in terms of getting a green light from a blood, blood work perspective in terms of, right, we're good to go in terms of stack escalation again because we basically spent the last eight weeks of time on true TRT, physiological TRT. So the first thing we'd probably look at before we start to look at any of the other metrics, the first thing we'd look at if we scroll down, have we achieved physiological status with blood work? So we can see here and confirm now testosterone 31.5 nanomolar. So the amount of milligram per week we've added in for the last 12 weeks has allowed us to establish around that 30 nanomolar threshold. So we are now what is effectively on. Hey, one thing to note, this is a very common thing you'll see by androgen abusing athletes is a disproportionately high free testosterone so is this actually reflective of physiologic not at all in fact you have such disproportionate high free androgen circulating that you're going to retain far more tissue than another comparable guy who's natural with a similar total t you know like look at this free androgen index it is 176 177 with a ratio going up to 104 his shbg is probably near single digits. But that's expected, to be honest, when you're embarking on this lifestyle and constantly exposing yourself to high doses of androgens, especially in a pre-contest scenario where you're just deploying the fucking kitchen sink of stuff, essentially. And yeah, like this is, uh, like this is TRT on total testosterone levels on paper, perhaps. Um, and off the top of my head, nanomoles per liter of 31.5. I had to look it up. It's about 900, but um, like that is, it's kind of funny how low this shit goes wherever he is, but like 900 is not that insane at all. You know, I would definitely say that is like physiological on paper, but it's just the disproportionate 
free. And the fact that this is maintaining itself chronically, like this is why he's able to retain the physique he is for the duration. Like it's not like his performance is like massively suffering and muscles like falling off his fucking body. It's ultimately boiling down to this. He doesn't have drops in his T levels because of, you know, lifestyle factors or a diurnal rhythm that's based on pulsatile secretions out of his ball sack. Rather, it is literally bleeding into his system chronically, and he has this disproportionately high free androgen index as well. Weeks has allowed us to establish around that 30 nanomolar threshold. So we are now what is effectively on TRT, and we have been for the last eight weeks. We can also tie into that alongside androgen to estrogen ratio. So estradiol for you, from based on what we've seen in the past, your level of E2 conversion your, is relatively high from what we've seen in the past in terms of experience, yeah. but your tolerability is also relatively good as well. So from our ability to allow estradiol to sit at a higher set point, that androgen to estrogen ratio here, you could argue estradiol is actually relatively high relative to where testosterone is. Estrogen being high in this situation has allowed us to get you back to feeling yourself over the last eight weeks. It's allowed us to restore physiological function. It's allowed us to, to restore libido. It's allowed us to restore mood, sleep quality. It's allowed us to restore your body feeling like it's not about to fall apart. So. It's also going to support his lipid profile and some, you know, potentially offset SHBG crashing, but usually that's not going to be satisfactory, but that's just another thing to note as well that it has a cross like supportive activity with. So estradiol sitting high because we can tolerate that is actually quite a good thing across the board here in terms of getting you back into a good spot. Would you say that the estradiol being high for too long or can it be too high to have more detrimental effects rather than health benefits? Because obviously with it being high in the off season, well, in a recovery phase as we've been for the past like f three months, it's allowed my body to like, you know, bounce back and be in a healthy position, but also then being high, can it have like negative effects or like, do you think that when we run the stack now, it will start to decrease or increase? What do you think? The most important thing to realize is when we start pushing this testosterone super physiological now, so say we go from say, you know, one, two, five, one, 50 a week and now we go testosterone goes to say you know 300 250 300 milligrams per week increases in testosterone is going to have a, an impact on an increase in, es in estradiol via an increase in aromatase but you've got to appreciate the fact that when testosterone increases it's not the only compound that we're going to deploy within the stack to come so we're going to use primo as the anchor of the stack and primo being a dht derivative is actually a very good modulator of estrogen so what you'll find is although your testosterone might go from say you know 31.5 to say 60 nanomolar because we're adding in primo bolin as the anchor of the stack, the primo is going to allow estradiol to be modulated when we push testosterone up. FSH. So when he says modulate estrogen, he basically is implying that it's going to compete for aromatase. So if you have a DHT derivative that is not a substrate for aromatase, but otherwise interacts with it in some capacity um, and or competes, it's going to prevent testosterone from aromatizing into estradiol, subsequently reducing the total estrogen burden, despite the fact that you might actually have a higher total T on paper and be literally injecting more T into your ass. This is why you see guys who use Primo when they use Masteron, like perhaps they end up with like an anti-estrogen type activity is it because it's like directly i don't know like lowering estrogen levels necessarily no rather it's by competition for aromatase um like this enzyme ultimately has a different affinity for different steroid hormones just like you know 5 alpha reductase does just like any other of these enzymes do that interact with these hormones there's ultimately going to be interaction with them all essentially to some extent but the extent to which that occurs um, is dependent on the hormone. It's also dependent on what your baseline state is as far as your estrogen levels. Like this will be largely dictate, you know, what your estrogen burden is post introdu introduction of higher dosages and different compounds will largely be dependent on what you're choosing, the dosage burden of the complementary anabolics, um, how much of a substrate for aromatase are those, if any at all. And then what exactly, what burden of test and or estrogen base is it competing for aromatase to kind of like not inhibit, but just, you know, prevent it from fucking going through, if that makes any logical sense at all. Like when we have testosterone, it can either stay as test, it gets 5-alpha reduced into DHC, or it gets aromatized into estradiol. If we add a bunch of Primo into the mix, and let's just say Primo is competing for aromatase, now we have less test that can convert to a estradiol and more that can otherwise potentially be 5-alpha reduced, given the fact that primabolin is a 5-alpha reduced anabolic agent to begin with. So it's not going to be interacting with 5-alpha reductase in any significant capacity. So we're going to have a diversion perhaps into more DHC production, which 
downstream is going to be problematic as fuck for hair loss, but that's where hopefully he's on finasteride proactively or something at this point. I cannot fucking imagine he wouldn't be at this point given the multitude of videos um, I put out and the amount of research he's probably done at this point because he does give a shit about his hair. And if you haven't seen some of those videos, I did a video like Brandon Harding loses his hair on RAD140, I think a while ago and kind of explained why and just like, you know, what parts of his stack were kind of like problematic potentially. That was a while ago at this point, but um, yeah, ultimately test is going to get kind of like diverted when you add in compounds that are already 5-alpha reduced and have affinity for the aromatase enzyme. And that's where you end up with um, more anabolics in your stack, but lower estrogen levels comparatively in a paradoxical manner. Why is that it's literally interaction with aromatase? LH, the gonadotropin hormones, these guys here, the gonadotropin hormones releasing the pituitary gland. Obviously, because we're using exogenous testosterone, these guys are going to get shut down via negative feedback loop, so that's to be expected. Free testosterone is obviously high because if we look up at SHBG, SHBG is low. Because yeah, so a 17.8, you know, like within striking distance of single digits, this is something that will definitely fall into the single digits once he starts his off season, and is something we see commonly in bodybuilders, even when they go down to like TRT, you know, like the body is essentially in a perpetual state of androgen dominance relative to the the relative lack of binding protein production um, being driven down by androgen abuse essentially like high insulin activity high androgen abuse all this stuff is going to drive down shbg and it's very difficult to get it back into range um it doesn't mean you can't like function with a low shbg it just puts you in a more like sympathetically driven state because you are essentially getting rid of the regulating mechanism that kind of maintains homeostasis between free androgen levels in the body relative to total so you have kind of like a hyper androgenic dominant free hormone environment where this shit is circulating around and free to act in any which way it wants may even you know be more psychoactive may be more problematic on the heart Etc. But this is kind of like, again just the price you pay to expose yourself to these kind of androgens in general, as well as the dosages deployed. And it's it's not like this guy's irresponsible with his dosages really at all, from what I've seen. But ultimately, like you have individuals who are walking around like you know with shitty SHBG levels just by like sheer lifestyle factors, um, and even women with like polycystic ovarian syndrome, like it's not that hard to fuck your SHBG up. So when it comes to exogenous androgens, you know, even like mediocre deployment of like, you know, synthetic anabolic agents and like reasonable doses of test will definitely get you down there. So I don't know, like, eventually he'll probably rectify that once he goes to a like really, like a really elaborate clean out period, you know, later in his career probably. But I mean, for now, I would imagine this number is going to hover between single digits and like 20 for like the fucking rest of his bodybuilding career unless he takes some significant off time uh but that's just kind of what happens dude we're using 25 milligrams of provirin a day at the moment so your sex what the fuck he's on provirin too hang on i gotta go back and listen to that free testosterone is obviously high because if we look up at shbg shbg is low because we're using 25 milligrams of provider on a day at the moment so your sex hormone binding globulin being at the lower end of the spectrum allows for higher free testosterone Take okay so like do i think there's a use of proviron really in bodybuilding not really you know i think it's a shit drug personally i think it's something that is good for managing individuals who have actually clinically high shbg and need something to occupy it to then free up you know testosterone that is otherwise putting them in a state of like pseudo hypogonadism essentially where they have symptoms of low t despite having like normal total t like those individuals have such a disp disproportionate amount bound up by shbg that it actually becomes problematic from a free androgen context those individuals, I think, benefit from Proviron. To put a bodybuilder who probably had like a fucking like low normal SHBG to begin with on Proviron to make his like test work better, just to put him into clinically low territory with this like another fucking synthetic anabolic essentially, although, you know, if you can even call it anabolic with how poor it is, it's fucking horrible on hair. It has absolutely no anabolic activity essentially. And you're basically taking your SHBG from like not great to shitty it 
while you're on TRT during the period where you're trying to like give your body a chance to rest and not have your brain exposed to like ridiculously disproportionate amounts of like psychoactive free androgens. So I don't really think that made sense personally. Um, I think he's been on Proviron before and I've mentioned the same thing. Like this is a long-standing implemented compound it seems in his regimen and I don't see why. Like what, like what about his SHBG like justified throwing that in you know what i mean like i don't know it doesn't make any fucking sense and when he gets into his off season you can imagine that number is going to be fucking like five to nine bro like it's gonna be it's gonna be rough take a step back and we look at the blood work in general might i add that this is probably the best blood work we've ever had right now because i, I remember the the blood work we ran in canada and the blood work we ran when you're in dubai were both were both off relative to the metrics that we yeah. have right now so this is some of the best stuff we've ever had we know and if we'd measured this post immediately post prep red blood cell count would have been uh would have been higher just reflective of just generally more anabolics in play so your total antigen load of milligram per week was higher at the back end of prep and that's going to be reflected in that red blood cell count so hemoglobin and hematocrit specifically would have been higher both of those are perfectly sitting in range now because it's reflective of you, you being on TRT. White blood cell count, there are more immune related specific markers. Again, if you would have kind of recently, you know, fallen ill over the last couple of weeks or you had, you know, infection or you, you know, you had, you're fighting a flu or a cold, whatever it might be, you know, the immunology of that would have been a little bit off. But again, we're in a pretty good place right now in terms of your health and your ability to, you know, keep a good level of immunity across the board. So the biggest thing for us will be kidney and liver. Th these are probably the best markers I've seen from you today. Um, okay, so... Well, I guess let's just listen to hear what he says first, but obviously stand out having a high ALT pre off season, not ideal. I guess it kind of depends on where you're at with your training. You know, are you taking, like I would imagine this guy would not advise him to not take off time before getting his blood work done to not have his creatinine like ridiculously artificially inflated. Like you can see, he's almost in like kidney disease territory with his EGFR here based on this heightened creatinine, which ultimately creatinine calculated EGFR is not going to be a highly reputable metric for a bodybuilder, but it's definitely still worthwhile to note that this is, you know, a red flag for sure. And, you know, subsequent cystatin C calculated Glomerular filtration rate would be ideal to be more reflective of the gold standard of inulin clearance for actual perspective of what your kidney function is actually like. Perhaps an ultrasound would be in order at this point as well, given the fact that he's been doing this for multiple years. Um, I imagine echocardiography also on the table. Shit like that I think would definitely make sense above and beyond basic blood work, but I don't know how easy that is to facilitate in uh, the UK or wherever he is date big thing for us in terms of kidney health one thing we've got to appreciate the fact that with both kidney and liver markers on blood work they're both heavily influenced by training if we were going to get a you know an accurate representation as to where all of those metrics will be from the kidney and the liver we probably want somewhere in the ballpark range of maybe seven to ten days off training completely because resistance training and breaking down muscle tissue will skew a lot of those markers now we then want to take them into take them into consideration with a bit of a pinch of salt there things like uh you know creatine level is going to be impacted by body mass level of musculature someone has egfr which is a estimated glomerular filtration rate which is like a renal function marker for an estimated um, value for kidney function again that's something that's done on a calculation so if your creatinine level ends up being high because of training your egfr is going to be lower than it could be if that makes sense so if your creatinine level came back here at say 140 because you'd just come off a you know a big leg day the day before dude i like can't help but notice like it looks like he's fucking beating off while he's talking like his arm will not stop shaking dude i think i probably do that with my foot but i've never seen somebody do that like with their fucking hand they're just like under the table like or this egfr could be you know low 50s but it's reflective of creatinine so you take those with a pinch of salt if we were going to delve deeper into kidney function we'd probably go and look in a, a like a cystatin c score which is a more accurate representation to what's going on but the big thing for us is there are no big red flags and there's no kind of general trends across the blood work of this isn't quite right and it's reflective here and it's reflective there none of that's currently going on at the moment so it's a pretty reassuring sign here i was going to say like one thing i appreciate as well is that when we do run stuff on a stack is that we do supplement kidney and liver health you know supplements as well like we don't just like put a bunch of stuff 
letting the body you know run a, run high levels of anabolics to like make sure those still maintain a high level of health on a cycle as well those things may be kept like sort of intact as we um run the, the off season so it's like insurance isn't it like the biggest thing there is that organ support is going to play a role the ability for you to kind of adopt a lower risk approach in terms of stat design is still going to be the you know still going to be the key player there but all that yeah. stuff on top is just kind of complementing what you're doing and, and it's a safeguard isn't it it's a safeguard for what you're doing one thing i was actually impressed to see as well was have you been using the metformin still or have you have you had it in or not no no so the, the, I, I would presume that the metformin because we we had 500 mega metformin in a day in, in the prep by the way the mention of the liver support kidney support like i don't know what subs he's talking about specifically but just like off the top of my head things that are useful from a kidney support aspect obviously also from a cardiovascular aspect angiotensin receptor blocker something that is going to modulate blood pressure and prevent as much uh kidney stress as otherwise would you know probably be occurring um it's also very cardio protective obviously above and beyond the blood pressure modulation as well just preventing the angiotensin 2 receptor 1 agonism that otherwise can lead to cardiomegaly down the line like androgens have a very direct impact on um, morphological changes of the heart which can lead to um, inhibited function as a consequence of just fucking massive increases in size is a huge thing um there's been some very very notable studies all but in rodent models showing massive doses of and i have a fucking alarm going off in the background sorry anabolic androgenic steroids essentially their effects on um rodent hearts you know again it's rodents but these rodents get fucked up when you put them on a shit ton of gear and ARBs were able to attenuate essentially all of the damage. So very, very promising extrapolated for humans. If you have a fucking rat on the equivalent of like essentially a like top level bodybuilder stack extrapolated out for the human equivalent dose and an ARB was capable of attenuating all the damage, like it's pretty fucking promising given the fact that these are tried and true medications that are well tolerated in individuals and have years of literature to support them, clinical studies, high safety profiles, etc. So being proactive with, you know, a preventative medicine approach to this shit, if you're going to be exposing yourself to high doses of androgens, um, it would be prudent to use something like a telemisartan or another efficacious ARB in your plan, in my opinion, not just for blood pressure, but for the direct effects of androgens on the actual morphological changes of the heart, um, and downstream to the blood pressure changes as well. The kidney stress, like an ARB is just fucking unquestionably a good idea unless you're an individual who's like prone to hyperkalemia or some shit from what I've seen. Above and beyond that, you know, like astragalus extract, I think is a good kidney support supplement. I've seen pretty blatant, um, like significant improvements in um, glomerular, good, fucking hard to say that dude, glomerular, filtration rates like time and time again i've seen it you know definitely stand um up where it's actually a useful supplement in my opinion to add in what effect does it have on telomeres and whatnot you know obviously it has some anti-aging properties that are you know interesting to at least note but ultimately it seems to be kidney protective and a potentially useful addition as well when they mention the uh like liver support you know presumably he's already doing stuff like i don't know, like tudka knack you know, if you can still get fucking knack, hopefully you can. Um, stuff like that, you know, obviously useful to be adding in, especially when even if you're not on 17 alpha alkylated oral agents, you still have liver stress from androgens, even if you're injecting them. So it would be prudent to be mindful of your liver health whilst on this shit, for sure. That HbA1c, which is like a, a comparative... I think it's 90 day marker for glucose presence in the blood. 24.3 millimole is very, very good there. Like that shows very high levels of sensitivity. It shows good good capacity to partition, good levels of insulin sensitivity. And I think if we were to check fasting blood glucose or postprandial blood glucose, like your ability to partition partition carbs, yeah. it would be very good at the moment. And awesome. given the fact that this is us kind of 40 pounds up in an off season, this responsive without using, you know, the likes of metformin, for example, to modulate that, that's a really good place to be, which is positive. Awesome. So so when we take insulin, we're gonna get massive. Well, at the, the moment you wouldn't need any insulin at all because <laughs> yeah, the pancreas is doing Because doesn't insulin just like like increase that sensitivity is that the whole point so like the use the use of insulin in a in a phase is basically you'd want to try and use 
It's a lot of bracelets, bro. Provides insulin to alleviate stress off the pancreas of having produced having to produce so much insulin on its own. So the, the B cells in the pancreas are going to produce insulin relative to your intake of carbohydrates and protein to an extent, but your intake of carbohydrates per day. So say if you're on 800 grams of carbs per day and you're fasting and and kind of blood glucose trends across the day are in the you know mid to high fives, then we know that right. I'd rather be closer to the fours if possible. So I'm now going to add in a little bit of exogenous. Say we used a basal insulin like Lantus, the long acting one, so just very easy application. I'm going to add in a tiny bit of that each day to now alleviate some stress off the pancreas from having to work so hard to partition the food I'm eating. But for you right now, if your blood glucose day to day is perfect and your HbA1c is 24 and your food's not crazy high, there's no need for us to really utilize the tool because your body's partitioning well on its own. It's not just to relieve stress off the pancreas, it's also to actually get nutrients assimilated and like uptaken that's even a fucking word into your cells more effectively because ultimately it is going to actually help you get a super physiological amount of like glycogen restoration essentially and actually get uptake of these nutrients above and beyond what you otherwise would be capable of endogenously despite the fact that you have a functioning pancreas it doesn't mean it can replicate exactly what insulin can do exogenously in all scenarios so there are definitely times and places to be deploying something in a super physiological context when you're a bodybuilder who is you know smashing your body with these fucking hectic workouts using weights that otherwise should not be even possible to lift given your you know natural endogenous production shit like that you're going to put yourself in a position with the amount of muscle tissue you have with the amount of food you require to grow certain situations may justify i'm not saying you should do it or anyone really should be considering it but Ultimately, there's more reasons to deploy insulin downstream growth factor production that are totally irrelevant to beta cell preservation. Say in yeah. three or four months time when we're really pushing the envelope with food, it's another little tool that we can use, another pathway we can go down. Realistically, alleviate stress off your body from having to process so much food on its own, but also be in a position where you're able to partition a lot of carbohydrate effectively, which is obviously another tool for us to, to try and drive. Cholesterol, so this is probably the one that we want to try and modulate now. So the biggest thing for us to consider here is... These are fucking rough, dude, for being on TRT. This is not ideal. The total cholesterol of 5.02 is being skewed because that LDL is, is, is higher than we probably want it to be, realistically. So LDL stands for low-density lipoprotein. HDL stands for high-density lipoprotein. The HDL is... Okay, I can't see anything unless I'm looking at it here. It was only on the screen for a sec, so I'm going to keep this here for a sec. 3.41 millimoles per liter is like okay so if you're from the states you're probably familiar with milligrams per deciliter for ldl so i think this is like 130 i'm gonna have to go double check that and then i will get back to you in a moment okay it's about 132 so in general like the data suggests that plaque buildup is essentially attenuated at an ldl less than 70. now does that mean you should you know, drop your LDL down to under 70 manually with drugs like statins, azetamide, PCSK9 inhibitors, whatever it is you're using. No, no, not necessarily. Like, obviously, there's going to be problems associated with that. If you're inhibiting steroidogenesis so significantly by literally nuking the parent thing that is responsible for the entire cascade that produces a significant amount of neurosteroids, and downstream, you know, obviously through the sex hormone production of testosterone, DHT, estradiol, that kind of shit is going to be dependent on endogenous cholesterol. Now for Brandon, obviously he, you know, is on a butt ton of anabolics, or at least he will be in the off season. So, you know, sex hormone production is less of a priority. So for him, you know, could he get away with lowering his LDL more? And like, should it almost be a priority for somebody who's putting themselves in an inflammatory state and is otherwise exposing themselves to high level sympathetic drive perpetually, you know, androgenic signaling, et cetera. You know, maybe it's a good idea to be a bit more mindful of your LDL when you're on this shit and manually controlling it than a natural would. But like a lot of people have heart attacks. Like it's very, very common um, among naturals as well as among bodybuilders who are enhanced. And ultimately um, plaque deposition seems to account for a significant majority of them. It's like at, at least based on, I think it's like angiographic studies reflect like 70% of myocardial infarctions are caused by uh, plaque rupture. That's a fucking, you know, scary number, especially given how many people end up with cardiovascular issues down the line. So, you know, for him, if he's putting himself in a position where he's like heightening the chance of cardiovascular issues like multiple fold, um, as well as the copious amounts of food, 
the like high body weight, the food needed to support that body weight, um, the anabolics, etc. You know, it's probably good to be mindful of that LDL and probably manually control it in some aspect above and beyond lifestyle intervention. But it'd be ideal to do it mostly through lifestyle and diet because if you can do that, you're not going to, even as a steroid user, he still has upstream hormones that he doesn't really want to fuck with with statin, PCSK9 inhibitors, um, ezetimibe, stuff like that, that, you know, maybe like relatively, you know, benign at like low, well-tolerated dosages. Like ultimately everything has a trade-off. And when you inhibit one process to manually lower your LDL, you're also going to be inhibiting other kind of synthesis of other hormones that would be necessary potentially for adequate brain function and shit like that. And obviously concerning too is the fact that his liver enzymes are already elevated and statins, zetamibe, adding more burden to your liver, you know, is not necessarily ideal. However, obviously plaque deposition is not ideal either. So there's definitely, you know, like a, you know, big decision that needs to be come to here if this is not controllable via lifestyle and dietary manipulation, which um, I imagine when you go into the off season with these numbers and you're gonna be eating way more food, and more fat dense food as well, and more carbohydrates. Like obviously he's going to have a balanced diet model, but I mean, eating more food in general and putting more burden on your body, like you can imagine this number is just gonna get worse given the extra drugs he's going to be putting into his system as well as the extra food. Some you know, manipulation could be attenuated to some extent, but ultimately I think he's going to have to use pharmacology. I think an ARB should definitely be deployed as mentioned. Um, for the basic like proactive, you know, preventative medicine approach from a cardiovascular and kidney standpoint, but from a lipid modulation standpoint, I think something like a azetamibe would be definitely reasonable to look at above and beyond, you know, your basic citrus bergamot, perhaps your red yeast rice, which again, when it comes to red yeast rice, you're basically looking at the, I believe it's the lovastatin component like essentially you're basically getting a variable dose of a statin when you use this supplement given that the main pharmacologic activity of it from the like molecule you're trying to essentially derive out of this fucking supplement essentially is identical to that of lovastatin the pharmaceutical drug you know but it's kind of variable what you're getting when you buy this stuff on the market. Like clinical studies have even found like high variability to a point where it's like you potentially don't even know what kind of dosage equivalent you're getting when it comes to comparing to a actual pharma controlled statin that has like high level regulatory procedures around its consistency in uh, dosing and whatnot. Because ultimately in the supplement industry, it's not like anyone's fucking fact checking that your red yeast rice is on point. As well, you know, having pro adequate fish oil intake, cardio, off the top of my head, niacin, you know, moves the needle, at least on paper, does it actually make a difference in mortality outcomes? It doesn't seem to, but you know, maybe it's worthwhile to look at as well. But ultimately, I think the main needle mover in this equation would be citrus bergamot, I think is a reasonable supplement personally, and actually has good data to reinforce its efficacy. Um, but above and beyond that, I think like 10 milligrams of azetamibe would definitely take care of this. And if you're gonna be looking at a statin or even red yeast rice extract, which is essentially a low dose statin, the data suggests that it's more useful at lower benign, more benign dosages stacked on top of a lower, more benign dosage of an azetamibe, for example, rather than using a higher dose of each. Like they basically work through different mechanism of that mechanisms of action, but complement each other. It's like using too high of a dose of like test and then getting side effects versus using like a moderate dose of test and a moderate dose of like fucking Primo or something. Like this is sort of the comp health supplement comparable thing. So basically statins inhibit cholesterol synthesis in the liver, whereas ezetimibe actually inhibits cholesterol uptake in the intestines. And when you actually compare the literature on using like a double dose of a statin versus like a smaller dose plus a low dose of azetamibe, like you get far more tolerable outcomes when you are using the smaller dosages in unison with each other. So if you have something like a citrus bergamot layered on top of a adequate dose of, you know, fish oil with an adequate dose of um, like a small little fucking smidgen of azetamibe with perhaps a little bit of red yeast rice or like, a, you know, more accurately dosed and like well-tolerated via the low dosage statin, 
Like, those are all going to move the needle a fuck ton and definitely put this guy back into good territory, in my opinion, even whilst on cycles. Like, I've seen very good outcomes with the ZMI, but it seems to be pretty benign. Although it's not side effect free, and some people can get pretty significant side effects from it, a low tolerable dose seems to move the needle a fuck ton and be quite, uh, you know, well tolerated in general. So I guess we'll see what he recommends for that, but that is my quick overview of, not quick, but quick as I can get it. HDL, you know, that would probably push his HDL back into range, at least if he maintained the same protocol. Once he goes on super physiological dosages though, that's probably gonna go back into the red, even if he's on this other shit that I just mentioned, but that's just the price you pay with HDL um, on heavy doses of androgens. Maybe it'll stay in the green, I just, probably not though consider here is the total cholesterol of 5.02 is being skewed because that LDL is, is is higher than we probably want it to be realistically. So LDL stands for low density lipoprotein, protein, HDL stands for high density lipoprotein. protein. The HDL is more of a comparative marker to most people are going to have either high, moderate or low HDL all the time. So if we're using androgens, your HDL cholesterol is going to degrade over time. And relative to the length and duration and exposure that you're going to go through, the HDL is going to basically reflect that. Now, before you even start anabolics, we could have found out that two or three years ago, you've got low level of or lower levels of HDL, you know, your family's got lower level, lower levels of HDL. So if we if we had your dad check his HDL, if you had your sister check her HDL, we're gonna see a reflection there across the board. The LDL is 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 a bigger marker for me to modulate. The LDL is more of a comparative marker to where you are within your lifestyle, within what we're doing in terms of your nutrition, within your stress. With this is why it's so important to have baseline blood work too before you use anabolics, because right now, like you could easily be guessing. Like, I don't fucking know what your HDL was at baseline. How significantly do your biomarkers take a hit when you use androgens? You will have no idea if you don't have a baseline profile within you know the systemic stress on your body so the ldl is a market we're, we're going to want to manage and improve relatively quickly in the earlier parts of this phase which is a relatively easy thing to do but it's just obviously identifying in the first place hdl at 0 0.97 i'm happy with i'd like to just see that as close to 1.0 as possible at 0 0.97 for someone that's using trt that hasn't you know that's used anabolics for the last couple of years consistently that hdl I'm, I'm pretty damn happy with and we know we've got good control of blood pressure regulation as well the ldl is the only variable that we'll look to to modulate there triglycerides are mid-range low so that's fine also there's a product that I'll send over. I think we've used before called red yeast rice extract. It'd be about 1200 milligrams a day. Um, Jaro uh, do red yeast rice extract. Supplement needs have got products on there as well that's got a little bit of niacin in there for HDL regulation. But that red yeast rice extract will bring that LDL down relatively quickly alongside some other bits and bobs we can do from a nutritional standpoint. So, <laughs> yeah. So, like, presumably, like, if you, like, I would assume Jaro's red yeast rice is on point. But I mean, there does seem to be literature to suggest that it can be quite variable like there was a independent analysis of a dozen 600 milligram caps of red yeast rice products conducted a few years ago found that the actual monoclonal k content which is basically the thing you're actually trying to get out of it varied widely from 0 0.1 milligrams to 10.9 milligrams and the lowest dose of lovastatin is 20 milligrams so you can imagine that you know this could be Highly variable in terms of what you're actually getting from the company. Now, Jero's, I would imagine, is the most consistent, probably third-party tested on every single batch. One of the most tried and true health subs in the market. So if you're going to get good red yeast rice, get good red yeast rice. It's going to be this. But there is some, you know, suggestive shit out there like the FDA blocking the sale of red yeast rice supplements that contain enough of the active ingredient to make them essentially comparable to that of Lovastatin because they haven't undergone like a drug approval process and it is essentially it can be sold without having to go through any kind of oversight given that it is you know in the supplement industry so having some sort of stipulations on how potent it can be at lipid modulation relative to the actual pharmaceutical equivalent sort of poses the question would you not be better off by just using a lower dose of like a more I don't know well Toler not well tolerated necessarily, but like well chosen statin, like from like an array of different options from actual pharmaceutical quality that's totally on point. And you know, is it within a certain standard or a percentage of accuracy that ultimately has a more strict reference range essentially for how, you know, significantly off it can be from its dosages. Like with the red yeast rice, if Gerald's gets a batch that has like a shit amount of monocolon K and it's otherwise, you know, far more, I don't know, let's just say it's way more potent or way less potent batch to batch. Like you'd have no idea ultimately. So, you know, if you're looking for 
actual statin activity, which frankly, I think should be like a, a second priority after ezetimibe deployment, probably, at least from what I've seen, like some of the data seems to suggest that, you know, it may be superior for bodybuilders. And we see certain individuals that end up with more side effects from statins, for example, than ezetimibe. Obviously, this is highly dependent, but you can, it's like pretty fucking common to experience like severe muscle soreness, you know, from decent doses of statins, which may not be the case with ezetimibe, may be the case, you know, every, they all have their individual issues at the end of the day, and it's definitely worthwhile to look into both. However, just from what I've seen in bodybuilders today, you know, coming sort of stemming from Leo's suggestion from a, just like a low 10 milligram dose of ezetimibe is like pretty fucking potent at doing what it needs to do. And it seems to be more well tolerated than the majority of statins. And with the red yeast rice, again, although it's like a pretty reasonable, like entry level statin with like a low dosage equivalent in it, you don't really know ultimately what you're getting from the actual equivalency to lovastatin. If you're going to like look into the literature as to like what kind of side effects you should expect, you know, what kind of dosage makes sense. Like you don't really know what the actual yield is that you're necessarily getting. And I would imagine Jaros probably doesn't want to like give out that information necessarily because maybe it puts them in a compromising position whereby they're essentially marketing their product as a statin replacement, which, you know, ultimately if it's as potent as a pharmaceutical statin and they're able to somehow quantify that via testing, like it's kind of, you know, negligent for them to not be, you know, registering it as a active drug and selling it as a dietary supplement, essentially, or at least, you know, I'm just, I'm just sort of ballparking my, my justification for why red yeast rice might not be like the ultimate go-to, but frankly, from like a mechanism of action standpoint and like a muscle tolerability, tol can't even fucking talk, tolerability standpoint, um, brain fog standpoint, you know, like I think is that in my, definitely is worthwhile considering as the primary go-to for lipid modulation relative to a statin, like a lovastatin. We can get that LDL down to kind of the And by the way, lovastatin does, is not necessarily the go-to um, statin that you should be using anyways. If you want to look at a good breakdown and comparison of statins, we'll probably do one on the upcoming Super Physiological Man podcast with Leo and Steve. But if you don't want to wait for that, just check out Leo's channel. He has probably the deepest insight onto what statins make the most sense um, to be using. It's low twos within the next couple of weeks, which I'm pretty confident we can do. It will bring the total cholesterol back into range and it will bring the ratios of those variables back into range and kind of bring the reds back into green, if that makes sense. So I've known from previous blood work as well that my cholesterol has been a bit of an issue. It's always been quite high. After doing a bit of research myself, I did know that I did like conclude that, you know, high cholesterol can be an effect of like being on testosterone, like higher doses for a long period of time. So it's like kind of something that maybe, you know, we can get better, but high cholesterol with the long-term exposure to high levels of tests is kind of going to be unavoidable because we're not going to like just stop taking tests. High cholesterol, your blood being sweeter and if you do have high cholesterol you're more susceptible to getting bug bites because bugs prefer sweeter blood when i go on holiday i get bit and no one else does because my blood's sweeter <laughs> yeah like ldl in total is also heavily affected by diet choices which i'm sure they already know but i mean like some people don't realize they hear you know ron DePatrick talk once about how fucking egg hyper responders don't exist and you're not actually going to get a significant bump in your cholesterol from eating cholesterol. And I've seen personally firsthand in individuals as well as myself that that's not necessarily the case for everybody. You might eat eggs and have your LDL fucking double. Like that's how significant it can be in some individuals. So you definitely need to be mindful of that as well when you're factoring this in. Because my blood's sweeter. <laughs> I've never read that one. I've never read that one before, I must admit. <laughs> yeah, no, I found it somewhere. Muscle health is going to be absolutely catastrophic because I'm training every single day and I'm recovering from some type of workout. So that was a given. That creatine kinase, of much like the creatinine, is going to be is going to be skewed either way if you're training. TSH at four point two one. So TSH is a hormone produced by the pituitary gland that talks to the thyroid, <laughs> thyroid stimulating hormone, and then the thyroid will then produce the the actual uh, thyroid metabolite, some thyroid hormones. Free thyroxine is T four. So your TSH is high. 4.21 but your free thyroxine your t4 is on the lower end of the spectrum now we know that individuals using testosterone and exogenous androgens in general are going to experience some t4 suppression there might be a valid argument to make that in this phase and you could transition this through prep through into prep as well there might be a valid argument to make that we could support that thyroid laxis just with a replacement dose of t4 day so i would be looking at diet first in terms of I don't know, like I'm highly doubtful he's like iodine deficient or anything basic like that. But I mean, 
to have a, a high TSH and a low T4, it's basically indicating that your body is stressed out trying to make enough thyroid hormone and it's unsuccessfully doing it. You know, your TSH is being spiked to then tell your body to produce more T4 and the T4 is still low despite the fact that you have a high TSH. Like this ultimately is the development of hypothyroidism, like reflected in blood work essentially. So I'm assuming he's going to recommend thyroid supplementation potentially right now. Daily. So if you're looking at okay. you know 100 micrograms or so daily, um, that will basically bring that T4 back into I would imagine between like 17 and 20. What would be the negative effect of my T TSH being high? So you mentioned 100 micrograms of T4 as a way to kind of bring that back in range, which is you know obviously somewhat reasonable. But I mean T4 monotherapy is kind of like the old school approach to hypothyroidism management. And like personally, I think when it comes to deodinase enzymatic activity as well as you know the implications of reverse t3 and just everything i've seen when you're essentially providing negative feedback and shutting down thyroid production it would be prudent to replace like all of the hormones like you have i think it's t1 t2 t3 t4 calcitoin if that's what it's pronounced I forget what it is exactly but there are multiple downstream hormones that come as a result of different enzymatic processes and it's not just like if you replace t4 you're guaranteeing that everything's going to be produced in a physiologically balanced way, and you may end up with just a fuck ton of reverse T3. You don't really know that everything's, get, like it could, not ever, ever, some people respond okay to T4 replacement and everything just works out, but I mean, in general, it would be ideal in my opinion to just replace the broad spectrum hormones that are otherwise going to be, you know, through negative feedback shut down essentially when you're using thyroid, thyroid replacement, not really knowing what his T3 is gonna be at, what everything's gonna be at, afterwards like i mean just if you can get desiccated i would definitely choose that um rather than t4 monotherapy pretty much every fucking time if you end up in a situation where you have disproportionately high free reverse t3 as a consequence of using too much t4 too as well then you may end up in a scenario where you need to supplement with more like straight t3 and maybe skip over the desiccated and actually go to a straight like cytomel or something but that would be to be determined based on his blood work in the future but ultimately i think the first go-to is like a basic like natural desiccated thyroid um replacement rather than just t4 monotherapy what effects are going to have on the body your tsh is high basically because the pituitary gland is looking downstream at the thyroid and the and the thyroid hormones in circulation and basically identifying that oh there's a little bit lower hormone circulation than i ideally want right now so i'm going to try and increase the level of tsh tsh being secreted talking to my thyroid to then try and produce more now this might be a cofactor issue so like the cofactors of the thyroid are different individual elements that will lead to better conversion of t4 to t3 or better secretion of thyroid and thyroid hormones in general and we can look into that but usually speaking it's quite a common trend you're going to see especially for males and especially for those that are enhanced and using testosterone and exogenous androgens especially for a long period of time growth hormone also plays a part as well t4 levels being a little bit lower than ideal which is why you, you very commonly see individuals supplementing with replacement t4 year round we could play around with potentially in the next month in the, in the next couple of months but if it if it trends consistently low it, it might be a it might be a valid um, reason to deploy would you just straight like supplement t4 or would you do like um, some thyroid therapy basic supplement that you know the one that Dordie was taking uh, i think it's called a uh, thyroxine or the, the, the thorn one that's that's like that's yeah. thyroid cofactors so you could potentially look at right i'm gonna i'm gonna add that in for say four weeks and I'm going to see if that conversion rate improves and my T4, and if we tested T3 as well, my T4 and T3 started to increase alongside that. On many checks, can you just do a thyroid test, like a cheaper one? You can do um, TSH, T4, T3. Um, so you could just check like full thyroid analysis. That's pretty much it for the blood work in terms of like going over all the markers. Based on the, these being the best results that I've received, we're in a respectable place to begin the off season. Yeah, 100%. Like I said, the only, the only things we had a little kind of red flag over just to keep an eye on were the thyroid, the, the, the lipids. Um, if we can tie both of those up in the next three or four weeks, which we will be able to, then everything else is good to go. Awesome. Awesome, mate. Thanks for your time, dude. That is where we're currently at. Blood work is looking pretty good. We are going to utilize ways to fix the cholesterol issue and the thyroid issue. We can supplement these things quite easily. These things can be fixed on or off cycle, and that's one thing we're definitely going to be prioritizing now, as well as implementing a different meal plan to begin the off-season. The new stack that will begin. I'll be making a video on that, breaking it down in the future as well. But the plan is right now, is to get your rest day. Um, no stack breakdown? Fuck, bro. Got through all that blood work and I don't even know what you're fucking using. Goddamn. I'll assume it's something like, you know, 500 tests, decent amount of Primo, some GH. I would imagine that's basically it. You know, like a re that's like a responsible off season, like how exotic do you need to get? That's tried and true. I imagine that's what's going to break down to something like that. 
you know, maybe because he's an estrogen, like hyper aromatizer, maybe he'll go with a lower test dose to start and titrate up accordingly, starting at like 300 and, you know, push the Primo up to 300, 400, 500, whatever. But I imagine that's going to be the basis of it is some sort of titration and or just a base static amount of test plus Primo plus GH and kind of running that throughout because I don't really see the need to be deferring to tons of other shit unless you wanted to try a 19 nor like Nandrolone instead or something like that. But, you know, it seems like his uh, coach knows what he's doing and is uh, pretty well aware of how this guy, uh, you know, responds to shit and, you know, kind of just has like good, reasonable practices. So um, I would imagine the test Primo and just GH is probably all that's going to be in there. Dosages to be determined, but hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Learn something. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments down below as far as his blood work, modulation of all of those biomarkers and whatnot, and um, I don't know, just your general feedback. All the comments help the algorithm. They're much appreciated. Like, subscribe, check out my blog. MorePlaysMoreDates.com. Follow me on Instagram at MorePlaysMoreDates. Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with. In the video description below, my TRT clinic, all telemedicine from the comfort of your own home, get high quality medical oversight from doctors who understand how to interpret stuff like this. It's their bread and butter, diagnostics, high quality education, and actual oversight rather than just prescribing cookie cutter scripts of test HCG and an astrozole and kicking out the door to make a markup on medications. We make the majority of our money on the consultations and diagnostics, which is exactly how I want it because I want our services to be highly sought after and seen as like, frankly, they're extremely valuable to the point that they're actually very underpriced, in my opinion. Ultimately, I want people to be coming to us for that rather than, you know, trying to use us as a testosterone mill or some shit. So getting a high quality doctor who is ultimately going to be ideally like a long term partner slash, you know, like a supportive individual that is ultimately facilitating the best decisions for you from a vitality, quality of life, longevity, performance standpoint, all aspects of um, preventative medicine, um, optimization of all kind of, you know, not just your biomarkers, but as well as like basic like mental function, um, perf like sports performance. Like we're basically turnkey and we do it all and we handle very niched out topics as well, like genetics, um, autoimmune, Things that are otherwise going to be completely over the head of most, a lot of these clinics that frankly can't even do men's TRT properly. So if you want a high quality doctor who is actually looking out for your best interest from a like education standpoint and actually wants to run through your shit with you and explain to you how this stuff works and be very mindful of the high quality information that we're trying to put out to the masses, check it out. Having a high quality doctor cannot be, uh, I cannot overstate the importance enough of how fucking critical it is to get somebody in your camp who is looking out for your best interests and is not just trying to call you out for being a you know anabolics user or is trying to get you on trt when you don't need it or any shit like that so check it out as well as anything else i'm associated with gorilla mind nootropic formulas gorilla mode pre-workout formulas designed myself from scratch my recommended diet model for gaining muscle whilst being mindful of sports performance and health is getting a diet that is micronutrient rich and factors in things like electrolytes, thyroid health, etc. Fucking critical so you don't end up with a ebook from some random fuckhead Instagram influencer in the fitness industry who is selling you a plan on if it fits your macros and hitting your protein and that's it. Because that shit happens. These fucking, you know, Instagram influencers no, no bounds with the lack of actual information and education they put out and the just marketing their sauced up physiques with their shitty plans. So if you want a high quality plan that's idiot proofed, check it out as well as anything else I'm associated with. It is all in the video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.